And tonight, Richard Reed is here with us, and he's going to be um, introduced by member Catherine Blankenship. So I'm going to hand off this, and she's going to hand it off to him. Thanks, Karen. I'm really happy to introduce Richard Reed, who's been um, someone that I've known for a decade or so. He's a real plantsman. And I think we're really fortunate to have him this evening talking about subtropical fruits. And he will tell you a little bit more about himself and how he became interested in this. I was just really at a loss as to how to get him to come. And it was so easy. I just asked him and he said, yes, he would do it. It's wonderful. So he, he has a real job and works very, very hard. And um, he's a chemist and a works in the field of uh, medical research. And he um, is very busy with his other pursuits in regards to tropical fruits. And so I'm thinking that you will all, there are, and we don't have a big audience here tonight, but I'm sure if you have questions, he'll know the answers. So I think you're gonna enjoy hearing from Richard. Thank you for that introduction. Okay. 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 Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming. Um, it was really easy to get me to talk. I love talking about tropical fruit. Um, if somebody says, oh, you wanna talk? I'm there. Um, I hope you enjoy this presentation. Uh, I like to be fairly informal. So if you have any questions at any time about anything I say, just stop me and ask the question and I'll do my best to answer it. Um, so as she said, I've been growing subtropical fruit for, I don't know, 25, 30 years now. Um, if you read my little blurb in the newsletter, it all started when I went to Simpson's Nursery um, out in Hakumba or Hamul, I can't even remember the name of the town, way out in the middle of nowhere. And they had this forlorn looking Jaboda Kaba. And the gentleman said, oh, it's a great fruit. You got to try it. So I took it home, bought it, and I've been hooked ever since. Um, so first of all, what are subtropical fruit? And for the purposes of what I'm going to talk about today, um, I, I'm going to use it in a, a very practical sense. Oh, you're not hearing me? I'm better? using is that better? Okay. Usually I'm pretty loud and I just yell and I don't need a microphone. Um, a very practical sense. Any fruit that's native to a subtropical climate, so you've got pineapple, guava, citrus, things like that, um, or any fruit that has been shown to grow in a subtropical climate. Um, Bananas and mangoes. I'll talk a little bit about bananas and mangoes. These are plants that were thought to be just tropical and you couldn't grow them. People played around and they realized, hey, you know, we can actually grow them here. I'm not going to talk about plants that are classified as subtropical by origin, but really are more temperate. A couple examples there are figs and pomegranates. Um, so I'm really sticking with the more um, subtropical type fruits. So first question, what is subtropical? Um, it's a very gross uh, determination. It's this band around the globe that is like from the Tropic of Cancer, the Tropic of Capricorn, up to about 33, 34 degrees. It's, so it's, it's just this narrow band. Below it, you've got the wrong button. You've got tropical zone. Above it, you've got the temperate zone and the polar zone. That's a, a good place to start, but it's not nearly that simple. Um, Elevation affects climate. Um, so if you've got like a, a mountain, and they, this is a classic example of the Andes. Um, way down here at the bottom, you've got uh, tropical areas. As you get up, it goes to subtropical and temperate, then up and up and up to basically where nothing grows. Um, classic example here would be a cherimoya. Cherimoyas are from Peru and Ecuador, right on the equator, but they're subtropical. And they're subtropical because they're not growing down here in the lowlands. They're growing up in this subtropical band. Oops, I missed one. No, I didn't. Um, geography also affects the climate. Um, it's not just a simple thing of if you're at this latitude, you're tropical or subtropical. Um, perfect example is if you look at San Diego here and Dallas, Texas, we're basically on the same latitude line. 
are the climates at all similar? No. Um, it's because that coastal influence that we have here gives us a much more mild climate. Um, so that is, you can actually almost go all the way up to San Francisco and grow a lot of subtropical things. Um, so it's, it's that latitude, it's elevation, it's geography and, and where you are, all of those kind of boil down into what makes subtropical. Um, practically, it's subtropical, a subtropical climate is a climate with warm to hot summers and mild winters. Um, average winter lows are gonna be in the 30s and 40s. Um, frosts are uncommon, so you don't get that really low, low temperature. Um, rainfall in itself is not part of what defines subtropical. Um, you can have subtropical deserts, you can have very wet subtropical, but as a rule, subtropical climates have distinct wet and dry seasons. So you have a wet season and a dry season. You have the Mediterranean climate, that's what we have, where you've got uh, warm, dry summers and then colder, wet winters. You've got a humid subtropical climate. That's where you've got just the opposite. You've got warm, wet summers and then cooler, dry winters. Um, and this difference is important because most of the plants that I'm going to talk about today come from this humid subtropical climate. They like wetter summers and drier winters. And that leads to problems with us growing a lot of them because these things don't like this cold, wet soil. I've tried a number of plants, too many plants to count, where they do great in the summer. They're growing, they're beautiful, they're lush, they're, they're just fabulous. They hit their first cold winter snap and the roots start to rot and they just, they're unhappy. Maybe they'll make it through the winter, maybe they won't. And if they make it through the winter, they'll get nice and green again. They probably don't make it through the second winter. Um, so that's an important issue. Um, why would you grow a subtropical fruit? Um, well, the obvious reason is they produce edible fruit. And I'm one of these practical kind of people that say, you know, if I'm gonna have a plant in my yard, I really like to have fruit on it. You know, I'm gonna use all that water. I'm gonna invest all that energy, all that time. I like to get something for it. And the birds like to get something for it. And the possums and the raccoons, and they all like to get something too. Um, but I like to get something for it. Um, a lot of them can be very attractive landscape plants. Um, and I'm gonna kind of go over that with a lot of the plants that I'm gonna talk about. So not only can you have a plant that gives you produce, good, healthy fruit that we all need to eat, it looks good in your, in your yard. Um, for the most part, they're pretty pest and disease free. You know, there are a few that get some diseases, but by and large, most of the plants I grow don't get any sort of pests, diseases, bugs. They just kind of cruise along and it's the climate that really makes them struggle. Um, you can get unique specimens for your garden. You know, things that I'm growing, things that nobody else in the country is growing. Um, just because I've traded seeds with people from around the world. And I said, I'm going to try to grow this. I'm going to try to grow that. So you can get some very unique and unusual plants. And I personally think, and I think since you're all gardeners, you probably get the same feeling that growing new types of plants can be very rewarding. You know, it could be, uh, I've done this. Um, once again, going back to things like bananas. When I was growing up, people say, oh, you can't grow bananas in San Diego. You know, they, they won't grow. They they won't survive, they're too tropical. And then how many people know about or remember the old seaside banana gardens up in Carpinteria? Couple people do. So here's a place up in Carpinteria, north of Los Angeles, where this guy is growing bananas commercially. I mean, he had a roadside stand, he can go, you could buy bananas, you could go buy banana plants. Unfortunately, there was a landslide and it ruined this whole thing. But um, so it, that experimentation and bringing new plants into what we can grow here in Southern California it is very rewarding. Um, cultural conditions. It's a huge variety of plants. Um, so it's, you can't really say, oh, these are the conditions you need. Um, the native climates they come from very widely. So it, you can't say this is, this is how. But in general, most of them want full sun to partial shade. There are a few that you can grow in, in deep shade. Um, most of them, I shouldn't say most, I think all of them prefer a good well-drained soil. Some of them you can grow in heavy clay, um, but they really would prefer a well-drained soil. Um, Frost-free are mostly so, and that, once again, that varies. Some can take a little bit colder temperatures than others, and I'll kind of talk about that when I talk about the different plants. Um, 
moderate water, which I know can be a problem here. Many can survive drought. I've got some plants that have never had water, um, but they don't grow as well as they could. Um, you know, they're not adapted to grow in our Southern California climate like our natives are. Um, they like regular light fertilizer. Um, for all my potted ones I use, because I'm lazy, I use Osmocote in the pots just because it's easy to put it in. Um, for all my plants in the ground, I use a nice organic fertilizer that's got sulfur added to help lower the pH of the soil. And I put a little bit on a couple of times a year. Um, they don't, most of them don't like heavy fertilizer. In fact, it's detrimental for a lot of them. Um, and most of them also like additional doses of micronutrients. Like I think just about every plant out there is happier if you give it a micronutrient spray or a micronutrient drench. Um, so with that being said, very, very cursory look at subtropicals. I'm only going to cover a tiny sliver of what's out there and what you can grow. Um, some of you are probably growing things that I'm not going to talk about, but, but that's a subtropical fruit. I just couldn't cover all of them. I split it into three groups. I split it into what I'm going to call the big three. Should be two and a half, but I'm calling it the big three. Second string um, and the minor leagues. How I divided these. Big three, these are the plants that everybody knows. Most of you are probably growing at least one of them. You can get them at anywhere. You can get them at your local big box store. You can get them at your nursery. You can, you can find them anywhere. Second string plants, these are the plants that start to get a little bit rare, but you've probably heard of. Um, if you want to try to grow these plants, you're probably going to need to go to a nursery, something like Anderson's or... Walter, Walter Anderson's Armstrong, El Plantio, you know, more of a specialized nursery. Some of them you can find it at, at big box type stores, but most of them you're going to have to find another nursery. Finally, the minor leagues, and that's really not a good name because some of the best ones are in this group. But these are the plants that if you want to try to grow them, you need to go to a specialty nursery, um, something like uh, California Tropicals here or Exotica or Ong's Nursery or Benedi Creek Nursery, one of these that really specializes in fruiting plants and more than that, tropical and subtropical fruiting plants. Um, but um, just to say right now, some of the best plants are in this group and I'm gonna talk about them. So what are the big three or big two and a half? Bananas, citrus, and avocado. Like I said, probably everybody here has or is growing citrus or avocado. It's just a very common thing to grow. Bananas, not quite so common, but since I called it Beyond Bananas, I figured I had to put it in the top. Um, so bananas, um, native, it's a native of the subtropical or the tropical regions of Southeast Asia, but it's, it's spread worldwide now. Um, Southern California and coastal Southern California, that's pretty much the northern limits of where you can grow them, but they do grow very well here. Um, I've got a couple banana plants that I keep in pots just for propagation. My next door neighbor has a huge banana um, plant or group of plants that, um, that he always shares his banana with me so I don't have to grow my own. Um, they do like lots of water and lots of fertilizer, kind of a downside for the bananas. Um, However, if you grow them in an area that doesn't have a lot of wind and is kind of protected and you've got a corner like this picture we've got here, um, they can be really beautiful plants. If you're looking for that real tropical look in your yard um, and you've got the right place for it, they can be great and they can produce bananas, um, which are so much better than the bananas you go buy at your local grocery store. Um, if you've never had bananas off a, a homegrown banana off a tree, you really got to try them. Find somebody that grows bananas and try them because they are so much better um, than the Cavendish banana that you get at the store. It's been picked a month ago and shipped on a container ship. Um, they're just great. Citrus. Once again, who, who isn't growing citrus? I guess would be the better question. Um, everybody's growing citrus. I'm not going to say much about these. Um, it's the quintessential subtropical fruit. You know, it is, it comes from a subtropical climate. It, it, it just is. Thought to be native to East Asia. It's been domesticated for so long, nobody's exactly sure where they came from. Um, 
They can take light frosts to moderate frosts, depending on the variety. Once again, citrus is huge. It's not just oranges, but you've got pomelos, you've got oranges, you've got lemons, you've got kumquats, you've got all these different trees. So it's really kind of hard to, to, to generalize. Um, they're attractive trees. Uh, they respond very well to micronutrients, I have found, um, especially if you've got clay soil. Um, I grow mine in I've got a weird yard that's got this ferruginous sandstone on one half and heavy clay on the other. And I can grow plants beautifully on one half and things struggle on the other. Um, my citrus are all on the stuff where they struggle. I should move them over. Um, avocados, once again, avocados is another very classical subtropical fruit. Comes from the uh, Central America and the West Indies. They're in general, slightly less cold hardy than citrus. Um, they don't like or draining soils or hard water. Um, I know my avocado right now is looking a little sad. It's got the salt leaf burn all over it. Um, they can be messy with the leaves because they've got that very shallow root system that they like a heavy mulch on their, on their roots. Um, so they're not really the most attractive landscape plants. But if you like the avocados, it's, it's worth growing them. Okay, now we're getting into the more subtropicals that you probably have heard of, but don't know a lot about. Um, the passion fruits, the pahoa, mango, guava, the anonas, the soap berries, the hylocerus, and the loquat. Are, once again, these are just some. There's dozens, dozens more. I could have put in the sapotes, the canisteels, and all sorts of other ones, but I didn't want to talk here for days. Um, Passiflora edulis. Uh, passion fruit. It's a native to Brazil and Argentina. It's a climbing vine, um, beautiful vines with absolutely beautiful flowers. Um, growing it, they, they can take a light frost, but they're, they're not as cold tolerant as some other things. Um, they really like regular water um, to really grow well. Neutral soil is best, um, but they are fairly adaptable. They require regular maintenance. Um, I don't know how many people have grown passion fruit, but these things, if they're happy, they just grow like crazy. Um, and you need to constantly be cutting them back, pruning them, sh not shaping them per se, but just keep them, keeping them from becoming this giant matted mass of, of green. Um, if you've got like a, a chain link fence or something on the back of a property that you kind of want to just hide, it's a great thing to plant there. Um, they will very rapidly cover it. You get this nice, beautiful, lush green fence in the uh, mainly in the summer. But really, if you've got a fairly warm climate all year round, you'll have some of these beautiful flowers, and then you get these wonderful purple fruit hanging off. Really, really pretty. Really, really pretty. And the fruit you can make juices with them. You can eat them fresh out of hand. Um, uh, my brother, who's got a huge passion vine, makes this concentrate out of the juice, and then he puts it in all sorts of stuff, just loves it. The only downside, and it's not really a downside, um, is they are short-lived. Uh, you might get 10 years out of a passion vine, um, seven to 10, I'd say, um, but then you just take a cutting, start a new one, and, and in a couple of years, it's, it's taken over the fence. I had a house in uh, Lakeside, uh, when I first came back to San Diego and I had a, a hundred foot long chain link fence and I put a passion fruit in there and in three years the entire fence was covered and it was it was beautiful absolutely beautiful I loved it Bahoa, also known as the pineapple guava this is something that you see around a lot but you don't know what it is um, native to southern Brazil and northern Argentina it's a shrub to a small tree. It's frost tolerant. It's very drought tolerant. Um, let me just take a step back. When I'm saying drought tolerant, it means it'll survive if you want to get a good crop of fruit. And, and this stands for basically all the things I'm talking about. Um, you need to give it regular water, but it will survive on low amounts of water and grow. Um, it's a very attractive plant. It's got these, these kind of blue-green leaves on the front, and then the back side of the leaf is kind of silvery. Um, it's got these beautiful little red and white flowers that come out in the spring. Um, you can do a lot with it. You can, as I got some pictures here, you can make a hedge out of it. Um, a neighbor of mine has them as topiaries, and they're like three balls stacked on top of each other. 
Um, and he didn't even know it was an edible fruit. In fact, I was, I was walking by his house and he was out doing something. And I said, well, can I try your fruit? And he looks at me like, what? I said, I said that's, a, that's a pineapple guava. It's, it's a fruit. You can eat it. Well, the one he had was horrible. Um, <laughs> and, and, I'm, and I'm really going to get to this a little bit later on, but they're grown by nurseries, not for their fruit, but for their landscape potential. Because like I said, you can make hedges out of them. They've got these beautiful flowers. And by the way, these flowers are delicious. Um, everybody I know that grows them, I always tell them, try the flowers. And everybody looks at me like, why would I eat the flowers? And then they do, and they come back and say, oh, you were right. They were so good. If I put them in salads, I put them on eggs, I do everything with them. Um, so they, they, they're really good flowers. But back to what I was saying, they, they're growing them for landscape plants and not for fruit quality. And if they could pick them for fruit quality, as well as a landscape plant, people could have, once again, not only a very attractive plant for their yard, but they could have something to eat too. Mango. Um, this is something that's becoming much, much more common in Southern California now. This is another one that, oh, 20 years ago, if you asked people, you could, could you grow mangoes in Southern California? The, the prevailing wisdom was, no, you can't. It's too cold. They won't grow. Um, little did those people know that back in the 30s, a gentleman, I can never remember his name, Bucklew, I think is how you pronounce it, um, on the ridge right behind Quail Gardens, um, was growing mangoes. And he, he bought this huge property, like 10, 20, 30 acres. I don't know how big it was. Um, and wanted to try to grow mangoes. And apparently he got a bunch of different selections of mangoes and found some that do very well. And some of his trees are still there. And I was at the, uh, the fair last year working at the California Fruit Growers Booth. And I think it was his grandson or his grandnephew or somebody um, is still living at the property. And he came up to me and introduced himself and said, do you know about this? I said, oh yeah. I said, I've been there a number of times. I've driven by. I've always wanted to go up and go up and talk to whoever owns it to kind of get some more information. He's like, come by anytime, come by, you know. Um, so once again, it's one of these plants that conventional wisdom was, oh, you can't grow them here. But when people started growing them, you realize you can. A gentleman, uh, Leo Manuel was instrumental here in San Diego of trying to grow mangoes. And his yard had a bunch of mangoes. He had mangoes that, he, that he'd hybridized himself. Um, and he proved that, yes, mangoes do very well in, in at least some parts of San Diego. Um, native to southern India, so in its natural environment, it's a large tree. This thing can get 60, 70, 80 feet tall. They can get just huge. Here, they don't get anywhere near that big, um, mainly because we are kind of, once again, much like the banana, we're kind of on the edge of its zone of adaptability. Um, they're slightly frost tolerant, probably a little bit less than an avocado. Um, they like a warm to hot climate. And really, they're not good for the coast. Um, my example here is I'm in what you call your classic sunset zone 24. Um, I live kind of on a bluff, just you know where the 56 freeway is, um, right at the very front of that. And the, where I live, what happens is the fog rolls in that canyon and kind of comes up and stops right at my house. I mean, right at, literally right at my house. Um, I always tell the story to people when I'm um, showing them my garden, especially when they come and they see it, that my house will be in the fog. I can go up a hill that's like 20 feet, just kind of on the backside of my house, and it's sunny. And you're looking down on the fog. Down at my house, you're looking up through the fog. And so, so it's that classic zone 24 where the fog sits all day long. You don't really get warmth. Um, I tried for, well, I still have them growing, but I've kind of given up on them. But I tried to grow mangoes. Um, and the story I always tell is when I first bought the house, we had a, um, what's it called? Uh, liquid amber, a liquid amber tree in the front yard. And I'm going, why did somebody plant this here? It's three feet from the driveway, so these roots are going to come. They're going to crack the driveway. They're going to crack the foundation. It's a horrible tree. I don't know why they plant it anywhere. Um, so first thing I did was I yanked it out, but I said, I want a big, huge tree that's going to sit in my front yard, kind of be a, a centerpiece. 
So I said, I'm going to try a mango. And I'm, so I went and I got what's called a Valencia Pride mango, which is a mango that's supposed to grow really fast and be a very, very big, big, big for a mango tree. So I said, I'm going to put that in my front yard. So I planted it in my front yard. Grew a little bit. First, it was like in the September, October. So grew a little bit. Next year, it started flowering. And so going, okay, I don't want it to flower. I don't want it to brew fruits. I want it to put all its energy into growing. So when the fruits got about pea-sized, I cut everything off and said, okay, this stopped it from flowering. What did it do again? It flowered again. And it kept doing this. I cut them off and it would flower. I cut them off and it would flower. Um, until finally in September, it put out one kind of weak piece of growth. Um, next year, same thing. And so the tree started out about this tall. So by the end of the first year, it was about this tall. <laughs> end of the second year, it was about this tall. End of the third year, it was about this tall. Just kept getting smaller and smaller and smaller as I'm cutting back the pieces after it bloomed. So finally, uh, I gave it to a friend of mine. I said, you know, th this is just not doing well in my yard. And he took it. Well, I found out later that the triggering for mangoes to bloom is nights right at around 60 and below. I mean, since it's fairly tropical, you didn't get much below 60 where they come. But that, but that getting below 60 is what triggers them to bloom. And in my neighborhood, basically, my nights are always right at about 60. Um, so it, it, it kept getting that trigger to bloom, and it never, it never gave me vegetative growth. A quarter mile inland from where I live, a friend of mine has a mango tree, and it does beautifully. It's, my microclimate was just such that it, it didn't want to grow. All it wanted to do was produce fruit. And I still got two other ones in the ground that have been in there for 10 years and are well, maybe that tall. Um, they're just, they don't do well. If you've got that warmer or hot inland climate um, from Mira Mesa East, um, as long as you're not in one of the really cold valleys, they do very well. Um, I know people who are in Poway, kind of on the hillsides of Poway, they've got them that are 10, 15 feet tall and they're just beautiful. Um, so if, that, if that's something that will fit in your climate, if you're right on the coast, I wouldn't recommend it. But if, if you're just inland enough, so in, like I said, that sunset zone 23 or 21 or something like that, mangoes can be a really nice tree. Um, loquat. This is another one like the pineapple guava. They're everywhere. And they're absolutely awful. They are absolutely awful. Quite literally, one in three houses in my neighborhood has a loquat that was planted by the builders when they built the whole neighborhood. And you, you just go in, and they're everywhere because they're really pretty trees. I mean, I, I don't know how you guys feel about them. I think a loquat is a really attractive tree. They don't get too big. They've got those beautiful leaves with kind of the brownish underside. They're widely attracted. They're pretty drought tolerant. They're pretty frost tolerant. They're, they're really good trees. Um, but once again, I think they're just planting seeds and growing them up, and they don't care about the fruit quality. But there are a lot of loquats out there that are, and I'm not a big loquat fan personally, but I will say there's a lot of them out there that are really good. Um, so if this is the kind of tree that you want, and like I said, there's a lot of things to recommend a loquat tree. Um, if you feel like you want to plant a loquat, don't go to Home Depot and buy one. Go to a, a smaller nursery and say you want a, a quality fruiting loquat, and they'll be able to say they'll be grafted trees, and they'll be able to, to sell you one that'll give you a good fruit. Um, so that's that's what I have to say about those um, guavas. Um, this is another one. I'm going to split it into two types of guavas. Um, there's tropical guava. Tropical guava is when you think of a guava. If you're getting guava nectar or guava jam or, or, or a guava anything, it's a tropical guava. And there's a number of varieties of tropical, tropical guava, but they're just tropical guava. And then there's all the other guavas. We've got the strawberry guava, the Brazilian guava, the cask guava, the Ariano guava, the, uh, the, the list goes on and on and on and on and on. Um, so tropical guava, this is, once again, this is the guava of commerce. 
If you get guava nectar at the store, it's tropical guava. Um, there are bushes to small trees. They don't get that big. Um, mildly frost tolerant. Probably they'll take about 28 or so. Um, very adaptable. You can put them in clay soils as long as it's not super soggy, wet. Um, you can put it in sandy soils. They do very well. They're somewhat drought tolerant, but once again, you're not going to get a lot of fruit. Um, it's a very lacy tree. It's not a real bowl. Um, but I, I think that that's something that's very attractive. They've got this absolutely beautiful peeling bark, kind of red and greenish brown peeling bark um, that makes them very attractive if you kind of strip them out or thin them out and kind of showcase that bark. Multiple different kinds of fruit for the uh, tropical guava. You can get the tropical guavas like the Mexican cream guava. This is a very soft, very perfumey um, type of guava. And then on the other side, you can get like the Thai guavas, which are hard and crunchy, and you kind of eat them like an apple, um, and everything in between. And they come in white, they come in pink, they've got, they all taste guava-y um, or guava-ish. I'm not sure how to say that. Um, but there's subtle differences. And so it's, you know, no matter what you like in a guava, there's a guava for you. And like I said, they're, they're very attractive plants and they're, they're fairly hardy. Um, fortunately, we don't have the, the fruit fly problem that they have like in Florida. Apparently guavas in Florida are really hard to grow because the fruit flies just attack them as soon as they start to get big and you get infested with maggots. I'm nasty, nasty. Um, okay, then there's the... I'm just going to talk about the strawberry guava real quick, um, but this kind of goes for all these other guavas. Um, strawberry guava, there's yellow and red fruited varieties. It's a picture of a yellow one here. You've got kind of the red ones on this tree here. They're native to Brazil. The slow growing shrub, they don't ever get that big, maybe six, eight feet. I think it's about the biggest I've ever seen one. They're frost tolerant. They're widely adaptable. They're attractive. I think they're a very pretty plant. Um, you can grow them in pots if you want. They're slow growing enough that you can put it in a pot. And for people like me who have way more plants than they do space, most of mine are in pots. Um, so I can move them around and shuffle them and get rid of them, do whatever I need. Um, taste wise, uh, I kind of like the yellow, of all these, I kind of like the yellow one the best. That's a personal preference. Um, they go, for, they all got kind of a guava ish flavor and kind of that. Uh, hard, large seed texture. Um, they go from everywhere from very sweet to very acidic. I've got a couple plants that I cannot stand. They're just way too acidic, but I've got friends that come over and strip my trees bare because they oh, I love this. This is the best thing ever. And it, it, that's what they like. So I keep the trees around just for them. Um, so like I said, there's a bunch of different varieties. You can just look, if you can taste them, try them all. There's probably one that you like and they're Like I said, they're very pretty. They've got these, they've got these kind of dark green leaves. It's a fairly full tree. You can prune it well. I've seen a couple of these done as hedges. They don't make as good a hedges as some other things, but you can do it. If you want an informal hedge, I think that'd be a better way to put it. Um, it's a nice plant, nice plant to grow. Dragon fruit. Um, I grow bunches of dragon fruit bunches of dragon fruit. I've got 60 something varieties now. I've gotten rid of a bunch. I had 90 at one point in time. Um, it's a native of Mexico, Central and South America. It's a vining cactus. Cold sensitive. It doesn't really like the cold. If it gets down around 30 or below, it will often freeze. But what's worse is these cold, wet winters that we have, they, they really get susceptible to diseases. Um, fungal and bacterial diseases and you get rots and these fish-eyed fungus spots on them that they don't really like. Um, full shade to partial, full sun to partial shade. If you're inland, they like a little bit of shade and some varieties more than others. For best results and for making them attractive, um, it helps to grow them on a trellis. So kind of grow it up or I've seen people do it once again on chain link fences. They work on chain link fences. Um, so you kind of get this, if you grow it on a trellis, it grows up and then it kind of cascades over. Looks very pretty. Um, you've got these gorgeous flowers on them. 
um, that are like a, just your standard night blooming cactus flowers that you know they open up in the evening and they close again in the next morning. Um, they don't need to be grown this way though. I have some that I've just ignored and they just pots tipped over and then they just kind of sprawl out as a vine all over the ground and they flower and they produce fruit just fine. Um, so they don't, they don't need to be grown this way, but if you want an attractive plant, um, you, you should put it on a trellis and let, let it hang down. And they're, they can be very good looking when they're done this way. Um, a neighbor of mine uh, has done this and put them in his front yard. And I think they make very nice, um, attractive plants in the yard. They're a really neat fruit and that you've got all sorts of different colors and flavors. Um, you've got white ones, pink ones, kind of magenta colored ones, deep beet red colored ones. Um, and they all taste different. And I'm going to say, being somebody who likes growing dragon fruit, if the only dragon fruit you've ever had is in a smoothie or from a grocery store, find somebody that grows dragon fruit and try a good one. Um, I, and, and in fact, it's funny, the very first time I had it, I had a white one. It was a gentleman, Ben Poirier, who had been growing dragon fruit for many years. And it wasn't ripe. And I tried it, and it was like, oh, this isn't really very good. Why would people want to grow this? And so I ignored them for probably 10 years. And then a, another friend of mine who, who was down at his house and looking at his subtropical fruits and trading plants. And he said, here, come have some dragon fruit. No, I don't want dragon fruit. I don't, they, they're not good. What do you mean they're not good? Not, they're, they're just kind of bland and flavorless. And said, no, no, no. So he goes up, picks one off the vine, cuts it open, hands me half of it. And I was like, wow, this is delicious. Um, they're, they're great fruit. Um, the only downside I have you have to them, and it's not really that big of a downside, is with the exception of the white ones, which are the least flavorful, to get a good crop of good, healthy, large-sized dragon fruit, they all require cross-pollination with a different variety. Um, so you're going to be out there, and if, if you've got enough plants, and this is kind of the way I've got now, because I'm a lazy gardener at times, if you have enough growing of enough different varieties, at night, the moths and bees and all the critters out there will do your pollination for you. Um, if you've only got a couple plants and you don't have a lot of bugs around, um, you're out there in the middle of the night with a little paintbrush and you cut the pollen off of one and then you go to the next one, you pollinate it. And first time I was doing this, my neighbor comes out and it's like, hey, you, what are you doing? It's like, Ryan, it's me. And he's so, like, Richard, what are you doing? <laughs> Because, you know, he saw me kind of rustling in the bushes with a headlamp on. He thought I was like a, a burglar or something. And I explained to him, and he just laughed and laughed and laughed. He thought I was crazy. Um, best part of that story is the joke was on him because when COVID came around, he, he, he was a, a computer guy working for Qualcomm. When COVID came around, and he was home all the time. He started gardening. <laughs> and now he's growing strawberries and he's growing... Uh, all sorts of stuff and figs and uh, mulberries. And he's always asking me questions now. Like, How do I grow this? How do I grow that? What, what would you do with this? What's this plant you've got over there? Can I have some of those? Um, so he got the gardening bug too. Anonas. Um, numerous, numerous species of anona. Anona is a genus. Um, most common one, you're, most common single one you're going to find if you want to try to grow it is the cherimoya. Um, second most common would be the atomoya, and atomoya is just a cross between the cherimoya and the sugar apple. Um, people, however, are starting to try to grow sugar apple and iyama, um, and their results are promising. It looks like these, once again, people say, oh, you can't grow, that's ultra tropical, it'll never grow here. Somebody said, oh, I'm going to try anyway, and it looks like we'll be able to grow them. Uh, small to medium-sized trees, it's really the only deciduous subtropical. Um, most of these subtropicals are evergreen, which is kind of nice. Um, I like evergreen in my yard. Um, this one is deciduous. It'll go dormant like in oh, January, February, it'll lose its leaves and it'll come back. Um, they're somewhat frost tolerant, pretty adaptable. Downside, once again, is this is another fruit that needs hand pollination. Um, in the Peru, they've got this little beetle that goes around and does it. Um, we don't have that beetle here. 
I know some people who grow it right by the coast have found that it's humid enough that, and, it, and it's weird because it, it's a life cycle where the, the flower starts to open up and it's female, but it's not producing pollen yet. And then the flower opens up the rest of the way. And now the pollen is able to, is, is fertile and is able to be used, but the female part of the plant can no longer receive the pollen. So that's why you've got to go in there and you've got to take the pollen out of the open ones and then put it into the, the, the center of the, the female plant. Um, some people that live by the coast are saying, and, and I've, I've seen it, so it, it's true, um, that it's humid enough that the female part of the flower stays alive long enough so that you can get a little bit of pollination, self-pollination um, by the pollen. Um, you don't get nice, big, beautiful cherimoyas, you know, like these big, huge pound and a half, two pound fruits. You get these much smaller ones, but you don't have to go and, and pollinate it. I personally didn't really have a problem with the pollination. Um, when I, I don't, have, I'm not growing them now because the tree's just too big for my yard. Um, but you know, I I found that if I went out every Saturday at like one o'clock in the afternoon, there'd be enough female ones, there'd be enough male ones that I could pollinate, and I do that for oh, three or four Saturdays, and I would have a hundred fruit. So it's it, it worked for me, and the delicious fruit. Um, it's very creamy inside kind of vanilla-y with a nice sweet acid balance to it. Got a lot of seeds in it though. Um, and they're good sized seeds. They're like the size of an almond. Um, kind of one of the few drawbacks of it, but it's it's really a tasty fruit. Um, the tree can be attractive. It has a tendency to grow these big, long branches. Um, they get big and long and they kind of droop down. And so you, every winter you've got to kind of prune them back and you get a, just an overly lanky tree. Um, but it's once again it's another one it's a very nice fruit um, really delicious fruit and it's another one that a fresh one white acre tree is so much better than any one you could get at the store but you know that's that's true with any fruit um, soap berries two main soap berries lychee and the longan um, both absolutely delicious fruits uh, the longan is a little bit more delicate in flavor I'm going to say um, uh, lychee is a little bit more pronounced. Um, it's one of those things where you get people together and it's like one group likes lychees better than longans, the other group likes longans better than lychees, which is great. Um, they're medium-sized trees, um, somewhat frost tolerant. They're, they do pretty well here as long as you're not in a, like a really cold area where the cold air drains in the winter. Um, they like regular water. Um, the long gun is really adaptable. This is like a bulletproof tree. Um, they do very well. Um, and no matter what you put them in, as long as it's not in like any tree, if you've got, you know, clay soil that never drains, you know, you do a percolation test and you fill it up with water and two or three days later, it's still full. Nothing's going to do there. But other than that, it does well in clay. It does well in sand. It does well in, um, does really well if you've got a nice, rich, loamy soil. Um, the lychee is still fairly adaptable, but just not quite as much. If you can put it in a really nice loamy soil or, uh, or sandy soil where you can give it a good mulch, it'll be much happier. Um, Longans don't like a lot of wind or lychees don't like a lot of wind. Um, and that's demonstrated in my yard very well because I planted two when I first moved in, one on the front and one on the back. And they were both about, oh, yay tall when I put them in, you know, just small trees that I had purchased. Um, the one in my backyard, which is in a nice sheltered area with a fence and the house is blocking it, is now 15 feet tall and probably 20 feet around. It's huge and beautiful. The one in the front is about six and a half feet tall and kind of scraggly looking. And the reason for that is, once again, where I live, there's kind of like this wind funnel. The wind blows up the canyon makes a hard right turn and then blows right down my street. And so it, every springtime when it starts to put out a new flush of growth, this new flush of growth got all beat up by the wind. And it took years of it just kind of this big, this big, this big, and looking all ugly and beat up until it finally got enough mass to it where it kind of acted as its own windbreak. And once that happened, it finally started growing. Um, 
So if you've got a place that's kind of sheltered from the wind, it's delicious fruit, very much worth growing. Um, they're all air layers. So because of that, they're kind of hard to get. You can't just propagate tens of thousands of them like you can if you're grafting. Um, but it's, it's a, they're both delicious fruit and well, well worth growing. Okay, now the minor players. And as I say here, this does not mean they're not worth growing. Um, some of these are some of the, in my mind, some of the best fruits out there, uh, bar none. Um, they can be really delicious. And I talk about Eugenia, and these are all big families of plants, uh, with the exception of the Carambola. Um, the Eugenia, the Syzygium, the Plinia, the Mercieria, Carambola, and then one other. Um, I was going to put more, and then I realized this talk is getting really long. <laughs> what do we got here? How much time do we have? <laughs> when do you have to be out of here? Because I can go on forever. What she said. Okay, sounds good. Sounds good. I can easily do it in that. Eugenia, lots and lots and lots of Eugenias. I'm growing probably 30 or 40 different species, some of which I love, some of which I'm growing only because I want to see if I can grow them. Um, that being said, there's really five that you're going to find. I mean, even if you go to someplace like Exotica or, you know, one, like I said, one of these nurseries around town that specialize in these rarer fruits. Um, and even of the five, it's really just mainly these three that you're going to see. Um, Suriname cherry, the Grumachama, cherry of the Rio Grande, star cherry, cedar bay cherry. Most of these are native to Central and South America. Um, and I'll talk about it a little bit more with the next couple of slides. The only one that's not is the cedar bay cherry, and that comes from Australia. And I'm still puzzled as to why they're calling that a Eugenia, and I'll get into that later. Um, first one, Suriname cherry. Most common, uh, shrub to a small tree, very adaptable. It's frost tolerant, it's drought tolerant. You can prune it into a hedge, um, does well in containers. It's got both red and black fruited types. And in fact, since we don't have a large crowd, I might actually have enough for everybody. One, we've got up in the front here, um, seedlings of a black surname cherry. That you're, that's that one over there that you're welcome to take home. And then I've got just a few, and I wish, like I said, I broke that cardinal rule that we all learned growing up. If you don't have enough for everybody, don't bring for anybody. Suriname cherries. Um, it's kind of the very end of my crop. Yeah, that, that's the Suriname cherry. Um, when you try them, they're not all perfectly ripe. So if it is a little bit astringent and a little bit bitter, that is because it's not ripe. If you get one of the ones that's that's just drop ripe, and that's the, the way you pick them, is if you just kind of like touch it and it falls into your hand, it's ripe. If you get one of those, I think they're delicious. Um, I think they're just wonderful fruits. Um, so like I said, you get the, the red ones are a little more resiny tasting. Um, some people really like that resiny taste. I kind of like this, which is sweeter and less resiny. Um, so like I said, if you try one and you like it, guys back there get one. If you want to try one. Um, if you want to try growing it, these are from the that variety that you just tried. That that variety is called Black Star. It's a grafted tree. I will say they don't always come true to seed, but all the ones that I have grown from seed from this particular variety, which is those, has been black and has been good. Some some I think are a little better, some are a little worse, but I think they've all been very good. So if you want to try it, there they are. Um, like I said, they, they make a nice hedge. Um, they're kind of lacy, um, not real full, but as, as you print them to a hedge, they, they look a little fuller. It's not quite like, and I'll, I'll, well, I guess I'll just talk about it now. Um, the Syzygium paniculatum, the uh, brush cherry or lily pilly is one of many things that's called a lily pilly. For those of you that have been around a little bit longer, um, it was that classic Southern California hedge plant. You know, that, that until the Eugenia, the Eugenia Psyllid came around and, and 
wiped them out. They were everywhere. I know I grew growing up had one. Um, they're not quite as full as that. Um, but if you hedge prune them, they are, they are fairly full and they make nice hedges. They make really nice informal hedges. If you plant them close and you let them grow up tall, um, a lot of people in uh, Florida do that. No. And so now you've got a nice windscreen and privacy hedge and you've got edible fruit to it. Um, uh, uh, next one is the Gromachama. This is probably the second most common one that you'd see. Um, once again, like I said, it's from uh, South America. It's a, it's a smaller plant. It doesn't get nearly as big. It's a beautiful plant. It's got these big, deep green leaves. As opposed to, you can kind of see the leaves on the, the ones there. There's a thinner, it looks more like, like I said, the, the lily pilly. These are bigger and thicker and rounder. Um, very attractive. It's frost tolerant. It does really prefer an acid soil to our clay. I put one in the acid side of my uh, land, uh, land, my little teeny postage stamp lot. Um, and it does a lot better than the one that's over in the, the clay area, but it still does well. This, this one right here is the one that's growing in the clay. Um, they're slow growing. Um, if you live in a hotter area, you might want to give it partial shade. I know that I will see that mine here in the ground will get a little sunburn like right after a Santa Ana. You know, we don't get a lot of Santa Anas. They get really hot, but after, if we do get one, I'll see a little bit of sunburn on the leaves. Um, and since it's in the ground, I can't move it out of the sun. Um, like I said, so it does well in containers because, it, because it's slow growing. Um, you get two varieties of fruit. You got three, actually. You've got purple and yellow and red, and they all taste pretty much the same. Um, and they do have, a of all the fruit that they call cherries, tropical cherries. This one probably to me tastes the most like a cherry. Um, so if you really want a cherry and you're in a place where they don't grow well, this is kind of a substitute. Um, cherry Involucrata, cherry of the Rio Grande. Um, in our areas, it's a medium-sized tree. Where it grows native, it's huge. They grow these huge, tall, columnar trees. Um, they're uh, frost tolerant. They're fairly drought tolerant. Not quite as good as the, the Suriname cherry. No, that's Jaboticaba. Yeah. Um, very fast growing. The only drawback that I see to this one is you can get Eugenia dieback, which is, I'm not sure if it's bacterial or fungal. Does anybody here know? Um, it, it's just a disease where the, the tips, it'll, it'll grow out a nice fresh tip and then the tip just dies back. And I haven't found a way to treat it. I haven't really worried about it because it just flushed right back out again. Um, it doesn't really kill the tree. It just kind of slows down the growth. Um, this is another plant that could be used as a, an informal hedge or even if you want to prune it as a box hedge, it'll probably do very well. Um, but if you want something that, that grows real tall and kind of informal, it would make a great plant for that. Um, this also has a fruit that's got kind of a cherry-like taste, not nearly as cherry-ish as the Gromachama, um, but they're, they're, once again, it's just another really tasty fruit. Um, last two, um, Siloe and the Rinwardiana. This one here, Celia used to be called Neonatita and just kind of like wander off as I have a tendency to do. There's one of these, there, there's a, a picture of one and that's the fruit. There's one of these at Quail Gardens. Um, it's may not be mislabeled now, um, but it was mislabeled and it was like Eugenia Nita, I think is what they called it. And, it had been there for I don't know how long and it had never fruited, never fruited. Bloomed every year, never fruited, never fruited. Um, it, tur it turns out that, that these need another one around. Okay, they're, they're, they're not perfect. You, you need another pollinator. And I, I learned this when I had one and it was the same thing. It was growing and it produced flowers, never produced fruit, produced flowers, never produced fruit. I had another one that I had grown from seed. It finally got big enough. All of a sudden it popped out one flower. I got a fruit off of that one. And I got a bunch of fruit off my bigger plant. I'm like, oh, wait a minute. And now every year I get tons of them. 
Um, back to the one at Quail Gardens. One year, it finally set a fruit, and a friend of mine called me up very excited and said, you know that plant at Quail Gardens that nobody knew was, nobody really is sure what it was, it never fruited? It said it fruited, and it's a star cherry. Um, so maybe somebody in the neighborhood had one, or the bee flew over and pollinated that. I don't know. Um, these are all grown from seed. Um, like, well, and I should say that most of these, the Eugenias are all grown from seed. There's not really enough market. I'm not really sure how to put it um, to start graphing them. Um, so being seed things, it can be very variable. This is a fruit that's very variable. Um, they've all got a really good apricot flavor. Um, some of them can be just strip the enamel off your teeth acidic and others can be fairly sweet. Um, the ones I have kind of lend towards the acidic side, but I found that if you take them and you make a juice out of them, you put a little sugar in them, delicious. Really, really delicious. Um, they're great for containers. They're very slow growing. They've got this deep, deep green leaf. I mean, really, really deep green. Um, and it's a nice full rounded bush. And so you've got that and then it's got the little white flowers. Um, and they start blooming, oh, I'd say in March or April, and they bloom all the way through till October, and you'll get fruit. So you have these little star-shaped fruit hanging off it, um, and they're really cool. They're really cool. Um, finally, the Rinwardiana. This is from Australia, and the things I'm going to talk about next are the Syzygium. At one point in time, both the Syzygium and the uh, Eugenias were all lumped into Eugenia. Somebody decided that we're going to split this as a GM off from the Eugenias. This is the GMs are all the ones that were grown in Australia and Indochina. Um, we left the Eugenia name for the ones that are grown in the New World. Um, but for some reason, they left this as a Eugenia. I don't know why, but they did. Um, once again, it's a great container bush. It's very pretty. Um, they they kind of grow like little mini Christmas trees. Um, the one I have, they, and, and all the ones I've seen, they just, they're small bushes. They kind of big at the bottom and they get kind of pointy at the top. They've got this, these bright little red fruits on them almost all year long. Really, really pretty little plants. I really like these. Um, it's a very mild kind of a vanilla-y flavor to the fruit, um, but they're really cool. They're really cool. And if you want something like an, a the, in front of your door, just a little potted plant. This is something I would recommend. Okay, the Syzygium. Once again, there's many of these. Most common one, as I just talked about a second ago, brush cherry or little pilly, that hedge that was everywhere here. I mean, it was just everywhere. I, you don't see them very often anymore, yeah. but I'm sure some people are growing them. Now, plants are native to Southeast Asia and Australia. Like I said, they the botanists decided to split the Syzygium off in Eugenia. These always used to be called Eugenia. There's really two that are grown for their fruits that you'll find around here. Um, the first one is the uh, rose apple. The second one is the wax jambu or wax apple. Um, the rose apple has been grown for a lot longer period of time. The wax jambu is, this is another one of those things where people were told, oh, you can't grow it. And somebody said, I'm going to try anyway. And they did. Okay, rose apple, it's a medium sized to fairly good sized tree, mildly frost, frost tolerant, very adaptable, takes a lot of different soils, somewhat drought tolerant. For those of you, and I'm sure you've all been to the botanic gardens, quail gardens, there's a huge one in quail gardens. Um, and it just rains down fruit. Every time I've been there in the late summer, it's just fruits everywhere. They're really delicious fruit. Called a rose apple, and it's called a rose apple because it tastes like roses smell. And it's kind of a dry fruit, um, but it's really good. And it's, yeah, it, it tastes like roses smell. It's really good. Um, it's a really neat tree. It's a little big. Um, and like I said, it, it rains down fruit by the hundreds of pounds when they get big. So it can be kind of messy, um, but it's a cool one. Okay, Syzygium, Syzygium samaragens, wax apple, native to Indochina. Bush to a small tree. This is another one that we are kind of on the limits of where it can grow. 
Um, it likes a well-drained, neutral, neutral to acidic soil. But once again, this was another fruit that people said, you can't grow it here. Um, and people immigrated over here from Indochina, from Vietnam, from Thailand, and this is a, a common fruit over there. And they, they love it. And they, like all of us, we you know, kind of want something that reminds us of home. But if we said, oh, you can't grow it, you can't grow it. And somebody somewhere in the last 15 years said, I'm going to try. And probably got a plant shipped in from Florida and put it in their yard. And it grew. Um, it's a little bit more delicate than some things. But if you have a good place for it, preferably like kind of a nice south facing wall or something where it can get a little bit of radiated heat or a fence or something to, to, to keep it a little bit warmer in the winter. Um, they survive, they, 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 I'll say they even thrive, and it's a delicious fruit. Um, I've got a friend of mine who lives just a little bit away from me who loves dragon fruit, and I'm, he doesn't grow dragon fruit, so I'm always bringing him dragon fruit um, for my trees, dragon fruit and bluefin tuna. And his father has a couple trees up in LA, and so every summer he brings me bags of wax apples. I mean, little shopping bags full. And I sit and I gorge on them for weeks because they're, they're a very delicate flavor, very watery, but you get them cold and you just, they're, they're crunchy. Um, and they're, they're just fabulous fruits. Um, but once again, this is another thing. I keep going back to this. This is another thing where somebody said, I don't care what they say. I'm going to try to grow it. And it grows. Plinium. This is something that everybody should grow. Seriously, everybody needs to grow this. Um, down there, I've got uh, a bunch of plenties if you want to try to grow them. And there's some fruit there if you want to try it. I'm going to say about the fruit, one, I'm surprised that I've got it in December. It's been a weird year and they did, usually they start fruiting in like May and they're done by late October. This year they didn't start fruiting till oh, probably late July. And they're still fruiting. These aren't, some of them aren't quite as ripe as they could be. So if it's a little bit astringent and it, it not really sweet, um, that's because I didn't pick them ripe, but I can't tell the plant when to, when to ripen. I just picked what I had. It'll kind of give you an idea of the flavor. If you do get a ripe one, you'll say, wow, this is fabulous. Um, I think you'll say that. But if it's not, say, okay, you'll at least kind of get an idea of what the flavors are. But if it's, like I said, if it's, if it's not real sweet and it's just a hair stringent, say, okay, I can taste this flavor. I can imagine if it was a lot sweeter, what would it be like? Um, it's a genus of fruiting plants that's found in the New World. Uh, depending on the variety, they've got some in the Caribbean. Uh, some in Mexico, most of the ones that are really grown for their fruit are from Brazil, Argentina, kind of that subtropical region down there. Um, species are coliflorous, which means that they flower and fruit on the trunk, um, which makes for a really beautiful, I mean, absolutely gorgeous presentation. You can kind of see that it didn't come out quite as well as I would have hoped. But you kind of see this, this is a picture. They're usually a multi-trunked tree. It's not like a single trunk, but multi-trunked. Um, and in the, in the springtime or all year round for some of them, they'll just be covered in these beautiful white flowers. And then later on you get, oh. I'm sorry? Not real large, I don't know. Deep, not really. They, they don't sink really deep roots. Um, that's more pictures I want to show you. Um, so the mainly coliflorous, like I said, I think they're trouble free and I think they can be really gorgeous landscape plants. Um, there are many varieties that are purple fruited. You can kind of see here how they look. On uh, this, this is just a smaller branch of a plant. Um, so they got the, like I said, you have the white flowers and then you'll have the fruit. Um, it's a fairly large one and you can't really see well the, 
the the white on the trunk but like i said they do they get this beautiful white fuzzy looking trunk um bush to a small tree they're moderately frost tolerant they do need to be kept moist all the time and this is a plant that actually tolerates standing water and i remember seeing a thing oh, 10 years back or so where a gentleman took a seedling about about me a little bit bigger than that put it in a fish tank of water and left it in there for six months with a little bubbler. Thing was unfazed. It put out new growth. It, it, it just kept growing like nothing was wrong, completely underwater. And at the end of six months, he took it out and it was fine. So they, they can take standing water. Um, so if you've got a spot that, that really you can't put anything else in, you might want to think of this. Um, they do like their micronutrients. I always give them a good micronutrient, but they do like water. Um, you can bonsai them. I was cruising around. I'd never seen one fruiting a bonsai, but I know that they're, they have been and they're becoming even more popular as bonsais. For those of you that do bonsai, you probably have seen them. Um, so this is a picture that I was, that was just kind of dawdling around today as I was practicing my talk. I found this picture um, of a uh, jibota cup of fruiting as a bonsai. So it's a really flexible, you can do a lot with it. They're Beautiful plants. Um, I wish I had a picture of my wall of Jabotacaba because I've got a wall with a number of different species. Um, and it's just green. And when they fruit, you can just see the purple all over them. It's beautiful, beautiful. And like I said, I, I hope you can appreciate the fruit, even though they weren't perfectly ripe. I need to give this talk to people. In fact, I've also got a talk just on Jabotacabas that I've given before. I need to give it like July when I can get bags full of ripe fruits and give them out to people and then everybody would grow to go to coppice. They would, everybody would grow. Um, with one problem is they're slow growing and they're slow to fruit. Um, these seedlings here are a faster fruiting variety. Mm, seven, eight years, maybe five years if you take good care of it. Um, but but plan on if if you want to grow one plan on it seven years or more to get it to fruit. I've got some varieties that I may never see fruit in my lifetime. Um, I was talking with somebody who's been really studying these, and one of the varieties to have he really got me depressed. He said uh, maybe thirty years before fruits. It's like oh god. <laughs> I'm glad it's pretty. Um, so the the point to that is if you decide you really want one and you decide that I'm going to go out and find them because like I said you can some of these nurseries have them you need to make sure you're getting a variety that will fruit fairly young um, and those would be and that's what these are these are red hybrid seedlings um, the, the, the red hybrid uh, fruits fairly young the sabra is a variety and that's a, a fairly common vari variety that you can find that fruits at five to eight, 10 years at the outside. Um, Phytanthra is another one that'll fruit very, um, re very relatively young in five, six, seven, eight years. There's ones like um, the one that was the predominant variety here in Southern California for many years, which was um, called the Paulista variety. That takes 10 to 15 or more to fruit. I've got some 15 year old ones that still have not even looked like they're thinking about fruiting. Um, a trunk of flora, that's one that they say 30 years plus. So if, if you find one, if you, if you go out and you look for them, they should know what they've got. Um, if they don't know what they've got, look for ones with really small leaves. Um, if they've got really small leaves, it's probably a sabra or a red hybrid and you'll be okay. If it's got long wavy leaves, stay away from it. If it's got really long leaves, run. Although they're beautiful trees, you're not gonna see fruit in your lifetime. Um, but if you wanna try, if you're young and you wanna try, they're well worth it. They are well worth it. Um, this is one of the few non-yellow or non-purple Jibota Um, This is called Plinia edulis or Kambuka. It's another very slow growing tree, uh, beautiful dark green leaves with kind of these pointy tips. This is one in my yard, it's giving me a couple fruit so far. I'm hoping to get more next year. Uh, moderate frost tolerance, 
once it's established, this is one of these things where they really struggle young. And if you can, I grew everything from seed. And if you can get it past that first three years, sounds like a long time. Um, they're pretty adaptable and they're pretty tolerant of our soil. They, they do like regular water, like all the, all the plenius. Um, it's got a much bigger fruit. You can see the, a huge Jabota cobra fruit. It's about the size of a golf ball or uh, maybe a ping pong ball. Um, these get much bigger. Um, kind of an apricot flavor. They're really good. Um, it, it only takes eight to 10 years to fruit. I say only eight to 10 years, but you know, for, the, for this genus of plants, that's pretty quick. Um, and it's, once again, it's a, it, it, if it never fruits, it's a very pretty, very tropical looking plant that, that just looks good in your garden. Um, uh, Mercy area, this, these used to be called Plinius. They all, well, actually, I shouldn't say that. All, the, all these plants used to be in, called in the genus the Mercy area. They split off the Plinius for, well, it makes more sense because they're very, very different. Um, so the ones I was talking about, they spun off into the group Plinius. They kept a bunch of them in the genus Mercy area. The Brazil and Argentina, they're native. Uh, very attractive plants. These are, I think these are really pretty plants. Um, I think they're some of the prettiest plants I have in my yard. Uh, moderate frost tolerance. They do like partial shade. Um, well, they also like regular water. Um, just like the plenty is, drought is not good for them. Um, they can be grown in clay soils if you give them a regular micronutrient spray. Um, for most of these, to get a good fruit set, you need a cross-pollinator. In fact, it's funny. I've got a guy coming down to my house from L.A. who is bringing me his uh, Mercier Gauquia plant because he doesn't have one to cross-pollinate. So he's bringing his down, and we're going to have a little party with the two plants. He's going to come back in a couple months, take his plant home. <laughs> what you got to do to get fruit off of some plants? Um, tasty little fruits. Um, their pulp to seed ratio is not really great, but for me, it's worth it um, because they're, they're just really good. And also, once again, this one right here, which is uh, Merceria strigipes, this is beautiful. It's got these long leaves. They come out this deep maroon color as, as they first come out in the spring. Beautiful. This, this thing is just like a solid maroon, and they slowly kind of get green, and then it'll put out another flush of this maroon, and then it slowly gets green. And it sits in this corner of my yard that's up against a fence, shaded by other trees, and it, it, it just loves it there. Um, all I got to do is find somebody that I can use as a stud plant so I can get fruit. Um, but they're, they're really neat plants. They really are. Um, two other Merceria that you might run into, uh, Merceria dubia and Merceria vexator. They're, once again, these are both slow, very similar, both very slow growing plants. Um, vexator, it's also called the blue grape, purple fruit, just like the plinias, very tasty fruit. Um, it likes the shade. This is mine right here. It's growing actually underneath a lot of my other ones, and it's very happy down there. Um, slow growing, frost tolerant, very adaptable. So it's a good plant. Um, dubia, also known as the camu camu. Um, camu camus are becoming relatively popular as a food supplement nowadays. Um, it's because this is um, dry weight. It's probably got the highest vitamin C level of any fruit out there. Um, so people are uh, going down to Brazil and harvesting the fruit and drying it down and selling it as a supplement. Um, it really prefers an acidic soil. If you put this thing in a clay soil or a non-acidic soil, it's dead. It's dead. Um, but it grows well, very well in a pot. So if you want to try to grow it and grow it in a pot, it'll do well. It's probably also the least cold hardy of the Mercerias. Um, I had one in my yard that I moved around and finally found a nice spot in the yard where it was um, uh, acid soil and it was happy and it was growing. Last year, I got down to the coldest I've ever had, which was 34, and it killed it. Um, so it's, it doesn't like the cold. 
almost done here. Carambola, you're probably all familiar with carambola. Um, star fruit, you know, it's native to Southeast Asia. It's somewhat frost tolerant. It's another one that really needs a well-draining soil and regular water, not all that happy in our clay. It doesn't like strong winds, especially strong, dry Santa Ana type winds. It can just, it just beats the heck out of it. Um, but if you get the right spot, it can be a really, really beautiful plant. It's, once again, it's very lacy. It's got small leaves, kind of pinnate leaves. Um, I know some people who've like planted them in a, in a inside corner of a house where it's protected and it's warm and there's no wind and they they get big and lush and this nice light green and with these wonderful gorgeous um yellow fruits hanging off it's really really a cool plant um some varieties are like so many store pop fruit most of the ones you buy at the store are kind of crunchy but bland um varieties that you grow yourself. There are some that can be very sweet. I know once again, the gentleman, Ben Poirier, will sell them at the farmer's market in Vista and Escondido in the fall and late summer. Um, and you can taste them and they're, they're, it's a totally different fruit. Um, it's really good. And the, you cut them and you get that wonderful star presentation. They're really cool. Last one, um, probably heard enough of me by now. Um, Mercianthes pungens, guajibu. This is a tree that's native to central Brazil and northern Argentina. Very easy to grow. Um, grow it'll grow to about 20 feet here in our neck of the woods. Um, hardy to the low 20s. Moderate water, but it'll, it'll take a drought. Blooms in the early summer. We get fruit in late summer. I think it's a very attractive plant, and it's an absolutely delicious little purplish berry. Um, really, really good, really sweet, a very unique flavor, unlike anything else. Um, it, once again, if, if you've got a spot, because it can get a little big, um, however, this is a really bad picture. You can't see it. This is mine. It's right here. It's about eight feet tall, and I'm trying to keep it just kind of in its little spot because I'm, once again, my little teeny postage stamp lot, I've got everything crammed in there as tight as I can get it. So everything is always constantly pruned so that they're not overgrowing each other. Um, but it's a very nice plant, a very, very nice plant. Okay, as I said in the beginning, this just touches on subtropical fruit. For everyone I talked about here, there's probably 10 more that you might be interested in growing. Um, there's a bunch of resources out there if, if you think, hmm, I kind of like to grow things that are not only beautiful, but produce edible fruit that I can have. Um, wide variety of resources. We've got the CRFG. We've got two local chapters here in San Diego. We've got one that meets down in Balboa Park, and then we've got one that meets up in Vista once a month. Um, lots and lots of people that are very interested in growing these and will share their knowledge and share their plants, and uh, um, as well as online. Lots and lots of online chat groups and, and internet groups and, and people that, that are really kind of like me, hooked on growing subtropicals. Um, and the last thing I wanna say, you know, when in doubt, try to grow it. Don't let anybody say, oh, you can't grow that here. It's not gonna grow, it's too warm, it's too cold. Try it because you never know. Wonderful. Thanks for listening to me. I know I can go on and on and on and on and on. I try to cut it short, but any questions? Um, yes. You said that a smaller size mango in San Diego is that a variety, smaller size tree? No, mine grow very small. Um, it's not a, okay, so there isn't a smaller but, size for San Diego. Mm -hmm. They don't grow very big. I mean, if you're if you're if they're asking about say a a potted mango, not not really, okay. but. Like I said, the person who really was growing them more than anybody I know, who was Leo Manuel, none of his trees ever got more than eight feet tall. Okay. Um, they they just were not really in a climate for them to grow huge. So yeah, they're easy to keep, you know, that big, that big around and loaded with fruit. Um, but potted, no, I don't think so. Any questions? Yeah.
far. Okay, anyway, I'm sitting in front of them in front of like the window in front of my house. Things with my camera is exposed above the window. I can get it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Can you summarize the question? Yeah, he was asking, behold, as he's got something he wants to plant and he wants to know if he can keep them low and still fruit. And yeah, you can. Um, you know, you can, you can grow them. And I've seen them grown as hedges that are, you know, you know, just like that tall. So under the front of a window would be just fine. You know, obviously you're not going to get huge crops of fruit like you would if you just let it become a, you know, 10 foot by 10 foot tree. But yeah. And it, and like I said, that's a plant that's just beautiful. It really is a gorgeous plant. Prune is a hedge, and you got those gorgeous flowers and the, the silver and green leaves, and there's a little fruit hanging off it. Yeah. So, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> I, I, how, how staining are the fruit? I, I can't, I can't answer the question. Did the mic go off? I think we just lost our mic. Um, I can't answer the question because I never let them fall off the tree. I'm devouring them. <laughs> um, they might be. They're not. They're not going to stain like a a mulberry. No. Um, because yeah, if you look at the fruit, it's just the skin that's purple. The flesh itself is white. Um, you know, I'm sure if it fell off and you squished it and you left it there, it's going to leave a stain. But I don't think that. It, but one, they don't. They don't fall off the plant. Um, they're ripe and they'll they'll sit on the plant until they they shrivel and look like raisins. Um, until until the birds find them, in which case the birds will eat them. Um, so I think to answer your question, that's not something you have to worry about. Um, and they and they do very well in pots. They do very well in pots. As, as you can see, I showed the picture of the little bonsai one that was probably not much more than that tall and was loaded with fruit. So. Anything else? Well, I hope you all learned something and that you want to go home and grow subtropical fruits now. Yes. All right. <laughs> Very great. We can we clap? Yay. <laughs> all right, everyone. We're going to sign off now. He's showing the in-person folks what varieties of plants he brought. No. Uh, two of them. And... We've already tried the fruit that he picked. It was delicious. So we're going to sign <laughs> off and I will uh, see everyone in January. <laughs>